Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, I am super excited to share with you a rising prodigy and a potential future superstar in the world of chess. This person has made international headlines over the last couple of weeks here in late 2023 with incredible results, breaking records left and right. And in this video, I'm going to tell you about some of those recent tournaments and also look at a couple of games, including a draw against a two-time national champion and a grand master. Of course, if you don't know already, I am speaking about eight-year-old Borona Sivanandan from England. She is eight years old. Her international rating is over 2,000, roughly, approximately. Her true strength is yet to be determined, and she just completed an astounding accomplishment. Bodana, and I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. I saw it was pronounced Bodana uh, Sivanandan in a, in a video. Uh, I hope that is accurate. Uh, Bodana recently played in a tournament called the European Blitz Chess Championship. And I do apologize for this ridiculous website, but this is chessresults.com, and this is, this is what we have. Um, this is a tournament of, like, hundreds of players, and if you look at this list, they are literally all Grandmasters. <laughs> there are obviously players in this event that are weaker than Grandmaster, but you gotta scroll all the way down, you still find Grandmasters in 140th place here uh, at the bottom. Well, after 13 rounds, Borona, at the age of 8, scored 8.5 points. She's right here, and she was... She's under my name. She's right here. And she was the highest ranked woman at the end of the tournament with eight and a half points out of 13. If you look at her results, they are astounding. She defeated a 1500, then she beat a 1700, a 2150, a 2180, lost to a grandmaster, beat a 2180, 2240, then she beat a 2200 and 2300, and at the end, she drew a grandmaster from Romania. She defeated the women's coach of the international team, the international women's chess team coach. I believe that's what I saw in an article. I saw that article and she is making headlines. The BBC is covering her. CNN is covering her. The, te the Independent, The Telegraph, they're all covering her. Absolutely incredible result. And that was not her only incredible result in recent months. Several months ago, she played the World Cadet Championship, the, the international championship of kids who are under eight, under 10, under 12, and she literally won every game. She went 11 out of 11. The craziest thing about her is that at some point she played 32 games in international competition and she went 32 and 0. 32 games, 32 wins. This is crazy. International master Lawrence Trent from England. He's, uh, he's obviously a very strong player. He's a commentator as well. He's commentated in our World Chess Championships. He participated in chess boxing. So you know he's definitely macho and very brave. Uh, Lawrence said that he's never seen anything like it. Lawrence himself put out a tweet that said, she really might be the best player that England will ever see. We will see. We will see when we get there. And if you didn't know, she is also featured in this video, which was on chess.com's YouTube channel and various socials, where she played against the 79-year-old British chess champion, Peter Lee. This was an incredible video. It was just beautiful to see how 70 years can separate chess prowess. And the two of them had conversation. It was, it, it was awesome. I'm not going to watch the whole video and react to it because uh, that's not really what I do on this channel. But I, I highly recommend you watch it after this video, though. Uh, and for now... Let me show you some of her games because she is eight years old and she plays chess like she has been playing for decades. At the age of seven, seven, not eight, seven, she played simuls. Borona would play simuls. She would play like seven games at the same time against adults who have lived like 30 years. It's unbelievable stuff. I want to show you a couple of games uh, from the uh, cadet that she went 11-0 against some of the uh, other best talented uh, girls in the world. And then that game against the grandmaster um, which, uh, which, uh, which she played in the last round of the European Blitz Championship. So, Borana starts with E4. She's an E4 player. And also with Black, she plays the Karl Khan. So, like, I mean, yeah, please become a Grandmaster. So, Borana played E4. Her opponent in this game was a, uh, was a young lady from, from Mongolia. Uh, we had a, uh, we had a Peer's Defense, Knight C3. And now, White has many options here. White can play Bishop E3, Queen D2, and Long Castle. That's generally called the 150 attack. Uh, it's called the 150 attack, actually, because of uh, English chess. Uh, 150 is an ELO. It's like a rating that you can have in the English Chess Federation. 
and um, basically they say that anybody with that 150 can you know can 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 play this. But Borona in this game actually shows up and plays really, really aggressively. She doesn't play queen d2, she doesn't prepare anything. She immediately attacks her opponent with e5. Clearly some sort of preparation, right? Trying to catch her opponent off guard. Keep in mind, these are literally seven-year-old children, like eight, seven and eight-year-old kids. <laughs> they travel to the opposite side of the planet and they participate in a world championship for kids. It's unbelievable stuff. I, might, I gotta turn my heat off. It's already, it's already hot enough. I just ate some, uh, some, some lunch here. Pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5. And you can see that normally white would be losing the right to castle, but actually in this case that trade is bad for black because white would get a very powerful rook. It was actually better here for black to play knight d7, which is a very difficult move to play. There's also lines where white can play h4 and h5 and just try to get as aggressive as possible, but um, her opponent, clearly thrown off guard a little bit, tries to simplify some pieces and plays knight g4. And this is all Borana needed. Because um, this very, very slight inaccuracy from the opening, just giving, you know, just seemingly just swarming a pawn here, is already basically busted for black. So Borona shows up, attacks her opponent, and here comes knight d5, and she's crashing through. Now, knight d5 is actually really interesting, because bishop can take the pawn, but the pawn is protected, so I don't... What exactly are we trying to do here? Well... Bishop takes e5 by black. Black spent seven minutes on that move because alternatively, you play knight to a6, but then I just take the knight. And then I play knight c7, and it, it's actually a lot worse than you losing the rook. You, you actually just get mated. So if you are going to play a King's Indian defense, you do, know, you, you do have to know how to deal with that central pawn strike. And if you don't know how to deal with that central pawn strike, it's going to get really bad. Borana strikes. This is a very instructive move. You want to remove the defender of that pawn. You actually don't want to move the pawn. You don't want to move the pawn. It is better for you to get a full piece, a full capable piece into the game to try to take and then take. Very, very bad position for black. For example, black can play c6, but then I'm going to take the pawn. So I'm still threatening to take the pawn. I'm hitting the bishop. I'm preventing you from castling. I'm threatening your bishop here. That's probably still the best move to survive because in the game we get this and now Bodona just bishop takes e7, absolutely bulldozing her opponent. You cannot take... I mean, you can. In fact, it's the top computer move. And then, you know, Black obviously didn't want to lose material. And it looks like there's actually a way to trap the knight. There's no way to trap the knight. King g7, the knight can just gallop straight out of the position. Bishop takes a, uh, e7 is a, is a very, very, very tricky move. Black goes king d7 trying to defend herself. Borana just, just simple. Cool, calm, and collected. Trades off. And now just has an advantage. Bishop to b5 check. White is not even up any material. Borona has just gotten out of the opening with an advantage. Her advantage is a better pawn structure. Black has an isolated pawn that's a target. Also, Black has a king in the center, preventing her own development. So Black is lacking in pawn structure, piece safety, piece play. Borona, very quick development. Look at this. Developing all the pieces. Black blocks and now just h3. First we kick out the knight. Or we can castle. Knight h6. And now white castles. Beautiful play. Developed every single piece. Kick the knight back. And now black has to make like perfect moves here to consolidate. Black probably has to go king d8. Black wants to play a6 and disallow a fork. So she goes rook b8. Borona just activates the rook. So now both rooks staring down the line. You can't play rook e8 here. You'd love if you can get a rook trade. Like black wants trades. Look at how much advantage goes away if white just trades some pieces. But there's knight f6. The problem is knight f6 is devastating. So Borona is just relying on this positional pressure. a6. Bishop back to a4. Black kicks her out. But still, black has not really solved any problems. It's really difficult for black to make a move. Black goes here. Now Borona jumps in with her knight. And now she applies more pressure with the bishop. She's looking to potentially remove the bishop and get the rook to e7. And the rook can't go to e8 because of the knight. Black goes rook d8. Borona plays knight d4. Now, if you take on d4, which is what happens in the game, the idea was not to take back. We go Zvishenzuk. In between move, we remove the defender of the square. We're going to get the bishop. We're going to come back for the knight. Black's king is swarmed, and it's real bad, because in this position, white just unloads a beautiful, merciless attack on the king, beginning with b4. b4 is a very nice and simple move. It deflects the king away from the knight, so white just ends up up a piece. a3 would have led to force checkmate in 10 moves. Now, I don't exactly, you know, anticipate Borana spotting this from a, from a, from a far away distance, but there is a way to swarm the king, but she, she does it with b4. She just plays the immediate b4 and uh, goes up a piece. Black's king walks in, Borona picks up a couple of pawns, 
And then here, rook d2, knight e4, bishop d1, boom! Traps the king on the outskirts of the board. It's like Sudoku. This covers everything. This covers everything. Those are covered by the knight and the bishop. A true group effort, completely freezing the king, and a beautiful game. Starting with an attack from the opening, fizzling out into a long-term positional advantage against the peace play of the opponent, and just an excellent, excellent game. She also wins with black, though. In this game, she played against uh, Ru Yu Yi, Yi Ru Yu from China. Actually, Yi Ru Yu got the silver medal. So the tournament that I just told you about, where Borona got a gold medal, uh, Ru Yu Yi got a silver medal. So she was, she was the second best. So let's see what happens when the second, place, uh, second best plays the first best. We have a semi-slav, we have bishop g5, Borona rock solid, knight bd7, and uh, clearly her openings are Cambridge Springs. So this is the Cambridge Springs defense, where you pin the knight like this, then you play bishop b4. You rely on various things coming to the e4 square as well. Let's see how well prepared the players are. White is well prepared. Knight d2 is the top computer move. Undeveloping the knight, blocking the pin, defending here, trying to play knight b3 and attacking the queen. So it's ridiculous that these seven and eight year old children have bulletproof openings. Like it's, it's unbelievable. There is a trap here as well. Uh, <coughs> let's just say something like this, bishop d3, there's pawn takes pawn, and then you try to hit there. Of course, if there, then white will take, but that is sort of the idea. Black plays bishop b4, which is the recommendation. White playing the top computer move, just playing rock solidly with the queen is just unbelievable. Like, I'm, I'm blown away at the level of preparation these kids have. Knight c4, Borona drops back, and then plays this move c5. So both, both players still in prep. I mean, they've both played 11 moves of cutting-edge theory, uh, trying to attack the center. White plays a3 after spending eight minutes, clearly no longer in her preparation. Gets a rock solid position. And now both sides should castle. White plays knight e5, which is fine. Borona castles, she's a principal player. White castles as well. And this is the position after 15 moves. So the two best girls under eight on the entire planet have the following position. How is Borona gonna play this? Well, I'm thinking the rooks want to come here, right? Because that's the way they can actually maximize their pressure. When there's E and B pawns, you kind of want to put the rooks there. We need to figure out if we need to deal with this knight, or if we don't, we should probably play H6 so that it's no longer targeted, or G6. So what are we going to do? Okay, there's H6, right? White plays A4, taking space, potentially breaking apart our structure. We go here, Queen A2. And in this position, the top engine move is to take this pawn. Everything else is equal. It's minus two seven because black can go here and white can't take with the C pawn because then you actually sack your queen for two rooks. Sometimes in chess, you can sack a queen for two rooks. It's not always the best, but when you can paralyze your opponent's pieces like this and even pick them up, it's gonna be the best. So in this position after rook C8, let's say white had played like H3, CD4 doesn't actually do anything because you make a big trade and then it's just probably a draw. But Borona strikes on d4 the second the opportunity presents itself because now she clarifies her opponent's structure. She doesn't allow the position to get opened. And these are called hanging pawns. Not hanging in the traditional sense where you could just take them in one move. But when you have a queen's pawn structure of d and c, that was awful. d and c versus e and b, that's called hanging pawn structure. And black tries to apply pressure and win them. Knight d5. You can't go c4 because you soften that up. And if you play c4, I'll fork you, I'll grab your bishop, and then I'm going to smash at the center, okay? But that's actually, I believe that's what happens. c4, knight, b4. All right, white making some positional mistakes. Borona just immediately goes for the bishop. Brings the second rook. Perfect play. Like, sophistic. She's seven or eight when she played this game. The threat now is to take the knight. There is a pin. White needs to spot that. She plays rook c3. Now, the only way black is going to make any progress is by removing the knight. It's very counterintuitive to move a pawn in front of your king like that, okay? Some people even dare to say never play f6. That is accurate for the most part, but you've got to play f6 in this position. Look at this. She's applying pressure, but there's no way to make progress in this position. If you're going to dilly-dally, you have to play f6, and she does. She convinces herself now is the right moment. She's going to target white's pawns. White still thinks she's on the offensive. The knight goes there. Now h5, another very well-timed and sophisticated pawn push to force the knight back to f2. And now she reorganizes re, re, uh, her pieces. Look at this. And it actually turns out that white should have never been overextending in the first place because now all of these threats are on the board. White goes queen e2 back, trying to create a little bit of counterplay. Now Borona just has to keep her nerves. And which one does she go for? She doesn't go for anything. 
She doesn't go for anything. She threatens mate, which is surprisingly difficult to stop. White plays rook g3, but now the h-pawn, which was going to get captured a move ago by the queen, is utilized as an attacking mechanism. The rook will now be stuck on the outskirts of the board trying to win that pawn back. And the second, the second that the rook went over here, Borana realizes the rook is going to waste time on the edge of the board, which means I can go straight down the middle. And the rook actually can't take the pawn because that's mate. That's mate on g2. A crazy game, like a, a very... Very, very high-class game. Rook takes, rook takes. You can't take my pawn. I'm going for this. I'm going for this. I'm going for something on the first rank as well. H3. She goes for... Oh, what a move. What a move. She could have went there and there, but she sacrifices the rook. It's a sacrifice in quotes because queen g2 is just... She's two pawns up, and now she just has to convert. She picks up a third pawn. King f7. Well-timed king move, kicking out the rook. She trades, and she takes the pawn. She takes the pawn because there's no way to get in against her king. That's the most important thing here. It's not about grabbing as many pawns as possible and running out of the casino. I hope she's not in a casino because she's eight. It's mostly about the fact that your king is safe and the queen and the knight can't touch the king. Queen c6, threatens a queen trade, threatens mate, queen d2, and she just plays a5. She has absolutely nothing to concern herself with. a4, white is completely stuck. Bishop takes g2 and her opponent resigns. What a game. If we ran that through a game review, I, I would dare to say she played at 99%. She played basically a perfect classical chess game. She played a great Cambridge Springs opening, played all of the right ideas at the right moment, and broke her opponent down. Maybe she'll get like 96% because, you know, she didn't play F6 fast enough and the computer's going to complain. Yeah, she gets 94. One inaccuracy was just wasting a little time with the queen. And what else? <coughs> Why else is it 94.4? She made a miss. She had a miss. Look, the computer deducts 5.6 percentage points for not playing F6. That's it. Her only mistake in the game was not playing F6 fast enough. That is nuts. Her estimated ELO this game was 2,500. 2,500! And if you think that's impressive, remember, she won every single game in the World Cadet. She won every single game at the European Youth Championship. She's 32-0 in international competition at that level. But she just played this tournament, the European Blitz Championship. And before I show you this game against Nivednici, I do just want to say, um, keep in mind what this tournament is. This is a 13-round. We're going to go back to that ugly screen. This is a 13-round, three-minute, two-second bonus tournament. Look how many grandmasters are playing. It was won by David Navarra, Ivancha, Kadri, Saric, Sarana, Martirosian, Bakro, Mamedov, Joe Bava. Look how many grand... Look how many grandmasters played the damn event. It is incredible. If I scroll down to the last person on this list, 150, it's Irina Bulmaga, who's, a, who's an international master and a, and a legend. She's a beast. Look how many players there are. It's, it's insane. 73rd place is, un, is unreal. I will remind you all. Could be boy, girl, doesn't matter. Like, for Borana to get this spot is, is if you look at the rankings, there isn't a single uh, another junior player here. We have Yuri Bushka, right? Under 12. He got eight points. And, and that's it. I mean, you go down this list, there's not a single other under 12 player. There's under 14, very strong. Uh, uh, somewhat, uh, this is a prodigy from Ukraine. Uh, Samonenkov. He's very strong. But like, th this is a sensational result. Completely unheard of. And she broke a record in this game. She, I think she, she tied the record for youngest player to not lose to a grandmaster in a tournament game. Not lose. <coughs> I think because she, she drew, right? I think there's also, you have to beat one now, which is a separate record that she has a chance to, to, to beat. This is nuts. I mean, this is... So here we go. D4, D5. Vladislav Nevedic is 50 years old, two-time national champion of Romania. Romania has great chess players. E5. Bishop F5. And he plays h4, one of the most aggressive variations of the Karl Khan, where you try to go here and trap the bishop. Now, you don't want to play e6 here with black. You want to play h5, h6, or another sideline. There's a6 and so on. Borana plays the main line, which is h4, h5. And now the main line is bishop g5 or bishop d3. Nevedinci plays c4, because again, you're playing a kid. When you're playing a kid, you kind of want to take them out of their comfort zone. She captures. 
okay? And then she plays e6, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. And then black is going to try to occupy that square with pieces. Maybe put the bishop on b4. Let's see. Knight to e2, knight to d7. Normal stuff. Knight c3. She goes knight b6. So she's just going for that d5 square. He goes back to d3. And clearly from the opening, despite her speed, the computer is preferring white ever so slightly. But the plan is still very easy for black. Knight h6 or knight e7. Put the knight on f5. Put something on d5. Maybe break in the center. Knight e7. Bishop g5. I love how quickly she plays. She unpins herself. She's ready to castle queenside. He goes long castle. She goes knight d5. I don't love that move. I wish she would have put that knight there and that knight there, but it doesn't matter. She plays here, and this is probably the best position that he could have hoped for from the opening. Because now, black struggles to castle, right? Also, bl black is constantly monitoring the dark squares, and, black and, and white is a move away from being rock solid. If bishop to e7, you take and plop the knight in, very unpleasant. So what does she do now? She goes for counterplay. She spends 20 seconds, her biggest think of the opening, which means that she's clearly uncomfortable here. Queen to b3 loses all the advantage because of the well-timed queen to d5. Apparently, white should have went queen b1, which is virtually unfindable. The idea of queen b1 is that queen d5 obviously doesn't really attack much, and I kick you out, then I go here, then you know, or here, and then it's bad. But queen b3 allows queen d5, and now she just gets the queens off. And she puts the knight right back on d5, and she says, how are you going to beat me, Mr. Grandmaster? How are you going to beat me with no queens? How are you going to beat me with no queens and four pawns that can't move forward? Five pawns that can't move forward. Dare I say six pawns? So if white has no pawn mobility, how is white going to win the game? Well, he plays rook h3. Now remember, when you're playing a kid, you still got to pretend that you're confident, because they're a kid. You never know, they might get scared. She takes with the king. She loses the right to castle. The rook goes to g3, she plays g6. She has no weaknesses. You can argue this is a weakness, but it's very easy to protect. You can argue b7 is a weakness, but, you know, we can argue forever. Knight d6. She defends herself. And I got news for you, she's going here. She's just going to trade the knight. And if she is successful in trading that knight, she's going to trade that one too. And then she's going to play knight c7, knight e8, or knight b5. Nevednici's got to do something now. He plays knight e4. It's a great position. She plays knight c8. Patient. She's not trying to attack. She's not getting too low on the clock. This is the biggest time deficit of the entire game. Knight goes back to c4. He's trying to keep as many pieces on the board as possible, right? The more pieces he keeps on, she gets into time pressure, she's going to lose. b5. Now it's time for her to create counterplay, but she is creating a weakness for herself. How is, Bod how is Bodna going to deal with that? Rook b6. She's got a minute left on the clock. She's down 37 seconds. This is the most unpleasant the position has been thus far. Rook a6 trying to kick out the knight. But the knight can now go to b7 and c5 or d6. And he does. The experienced grandmaster has tricked her with 40 second time advantage. Very, very bad situation. He's going to get those dark squares. Very bad. Rook b6. The knight lands on c5. Definitely not what the doctor ordered. a5 now, down to 40 seconds. Nearly a one minute time deficit. But remember, every time you make a move, you gain two seconds on the clock. He could go king c2 and maybe rook a1. He could play rook f3. He could try to build up with the pawns. She still hasn't moved a whole rook. Rook f3. Now she's forced to move the rook. Now rook g1. Clearly he's looking for g4. Maybe he should wait. Bodna plays a4. a4. Now it's plus one and a half. Nearly two. If white plays g4. If white plays g4 now, he's in good shape. Because this doesn't scare you. What scares you is the arrival of the rook. That is how this position will crumple. But a4 makes the grandmaster think. She's doing her best. She plays a4. And had g4 happened, she would have taken. She would have kept the g-file closed. But the problem is h5 and rook g7 is very powerful as an idea. But he takes. He took on a4, and he opened up the position. But wait a minute, she lost the pawn. How did we miss that? Oh, because she's forking, and now she's in. She's in white's position. And white's position is fully relying on that central blockade. White now doesn't have any time to play g4. Because after take, take... Black is going to get counterplay on the B file. Oh my goodness. So rook c1, knight b6, rook a3, rook a8. She's down to 27 seconds on the clock, but she is well timing her defense. And now he trades. That's a big sigh of relief because the rooks were going to team up to terrorize the black position. F3, knight c7, knight b3. And one thing that really strong players frequently do is they overpress when they think they have to win. But right now, that's not really a risk. She's going to lose this pawn though. Oh my goodness. King d7. She's lost the pawn. She's now down five pawns to four. Rook b6, and she has 20 seconds on the clock. 17 seconds on the clock. She goes to an endgame. 
She tries to tr trade into a Rook and Knight endgame where she's just going to play against that pawn. Now, traditional wisdom tells you it's an outside pass pawn. It's a pawn on the outskirts of the board. And probably white should be able to coordinate and win. King e7. Oh, this is very unpleasant. This is very scary. She has 11 seconds on the clock. Knight to e3. Knight to f5. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Knight e4 is, is recommended here. But he goes for it. G4. She takes. He takes. She's creating counterplay. Oh my goodness. He's sneaking a pawn. Yeah, this is terrifying. The pawn's three squares away from queening. She's creating counterplay though. On this pawn and this pawn. He runs away. Rook takes b2. What's happening here? The rook goes to h2 to patrol the pawn. The pawn is one square away from queening and it's defended. But she grabs the pawn just in time. And now she's got checks. She can come back and stop promotion. White can't do anything. Rook a8 to make a queen. Knight g6 just in time. Just in time with seven seconds on the clock. And that is exactly what happens. And in this position, knight e4, knight g5. And they shuffle and they repeat moves. They make a draw by repetition because there's nothing else. There is absolutely nothing else. If, let's say, white tries to play on, I don't even know how. Like if, how does white play on? White's going to lose the pawn. There's nothing that can be done. If anybody can play on here... It's Borana, who can apparently walk to e5. <laughs> and I don't know, man. I really feel like if she did that, her opponent might have... I mean, he would have just went back to g5. But uh, if for some reason he went this way, two pawns up. What a game. What a game where she held her nerve. She was just down a clean pawn and nearly 50 seconds in a blitz game against the Grandmaster. 50 years old. He is 46 years older than her. Think about that number. That's four and a half decades. So much experience. And with 20 seconds on the clock, she held her nerves and she made a draw. Eight and a half out of 13. I don't know how many women participated in the European Blitz Championship, but out of all of them, she ranked first. We saw Bulmaga there, right? We saw the uh, uh, Costa. She's the uh, national ch uh, trainer of the women's team. Just unbelievable. Just what a performance. And this is a player to watch. This is a player to watch. Shout out to uh, Borna, and um, I mean, she's being covered by all of British media. So we really might be, <coughs> we really might be looking at, um, who knows? The next uh, top five player in the world. It's too early to tell and we don't want to put any pressure on kids' shoulders, but spectacular stuff. Very, very exciting. And um, we're always on the hunt for the next Magnus Carlsen or the next Judith Polgar. So why not Borna? I hope you all enjoyed the video. 40% off holiday sale on courses ending at the end of the year. Enjoy your Christmas. Enjoy your holidays. Uh, get out of here.